Hello, I am Dr. Rob O'Malley. Thank you for joining us for this session, The Dynamic Past, How Science Helps Give Voice to Silent Stories. This presentation is Genetic Anthropology as a Tool for Reclaiming Our Histories by Dr. Jada Ben Torres of Vanderbilt University. The Black Lives Movement beginning in 2013 has marked a period of escalating racial tensions and civil unrest in the United States. This movement is more of a recent iteration of an ongoing demand for social change, including calls for the end of police brutality, disrupting the school to prison pipeline, and felon disenfranchisement. Though there are many similarities of this unrest with that of preceding decades, due to changes in the ways in which people communicate and interact with social media, this movement has resulted in reactions that demand the attention of policymakers, of scholars, and other stakeholders. As we witness this unrest, I've been compelled to think about what we as anthropologists and other scientists can do within the context of our classrooms and in our research to engage with these types of issues. Furthermore, as we witness calls for social justice in our personal and in our professional lives, as a genetic anthropologist, I'm compelled to also think about the different ways in which the lay public engages with scientific data that shapes both their understandings and experience of the past and its meanings on the present. So today, I want to share a bit of my research that illuminates the possibilities of using genetic technologies, specifically genetic ancestry, to engage with the dynamic ecosystem of the past and how this in turn influences the lived experiences of community members. In my research, I've collaborated with a number of communities across the Caribbean in order to learn more about the origins, the dispersals, and biological relationships of these populations. More recently, I've worked with the community in Jamaica to learn more about the African and indigenous interactions during colonial period. In St. Vincent and in Trinidad, I've worked with communities to learn more about the impacts of indigenous peoples on shaping the genetic variation of contemporary populations. Most recently, I've begun work in Puerto Rico to examine African ancestry. And this is the work I wanna share with you uh, today in a little more detail. So my use of genetic data is really intended to add new or novel perspectives to our understandings of how communities came to be how they are. Because some of the history of the region has been lost to time or as a result of systemic marginalization in which both African descendant and indigenous Caribbean populations were written out of history, genetic data offers the potential to address gaps in knowledge about these communities. In my work, I rely upon genetic ancestry to learn more about each respective community's past and how they understand the present with regard to issues of identity. With genetic ancestry testing, these tests tell test takers about their biological origins, effectively linking test takers to reference populations of known ancestry. So what ends up happening when a person takes a genetic ancestry test is that their DNA is compared to the DNA of people of known ancestry. And then using statistical methods, the relationship between the test taker and the reference group is made, and this value becomes that ancestry estimate. These types of tests are known as autosomal ancestry tests and are useful for getting a generalized picture of a person's ancestry. Since that DNA is used in these types of tests, they are inherited from both parents and consequently are useful for learning about both sides of a test taker's family. There are also other ancestry tests that rely on certain parts of the DNA. So specifically, there are tests that rely on mitochondrial DNA and others that rely on just the Y chromosome DNA. So these sorts of tests have a much more limited scope as they are only informative about a single lineage in a person's genealogy. That is in the case of mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited from a mother to all of her children and only females pass it forward. These sorts of ancestry tests only tell us about the direct mother's lineage. Alternatively, the Y chromosome, which is passed generally unchanged from father to son, has the genetic material that makes men chromosomally male. Um, this information, or ancestry tests using Y chromosome, are only informative about the direct father's lineage. From the broad perspective of genetic ancestry, 
both of these types of genetic ancestry tests, whether it's the autosomal or these uniparental uh, ancestry tests, they're useful for learning more about population dem demographics. Uh, they're useful for learning more about biogeographic origins, as well as the relationships of past populations as they're reflected in patterns of genetic variation in contemporary groups. That being said, there's also important caveats to this technology. It's important to note that there are potential dangers that exist from using genetic approaches in deterministic fashions that are devoid of any cultural or historical context. While genetic data may be able to illuminate biological relationships between individuals and populations from the present and the past, there are limits to this technology. These limits include both technical and interpretive limitations as to what can be learned about an individual's ancestry or population's origins. The technical limitations hinge on the choice of the markers that are used, the resolution that these markers offer, as well as the availability and the appropriately defined reference populations. When these technological limitations are crossed, ancestry results are unreliable. Interpretive limitations come into play when we think about how to discuss the relationship between past and the present. This is especially important because social identities, things like race, vary across time and geographic space. This point about the interpretive limitations of genetic ancestry and social identity is worth mentioning in a little bit more detail. I think that one of the most important caveats regarding the relationship between self-identification, so in this case race, and genetic ancestry, is that genetic ancestry is not necessarily informative about how a person self-identifies. Genetic ancestry can tell you something about where your ancestors came from. However, where your ancestors came from might have little or nothing to do with how you were socialized and the communities you identify with. In other words, Self-identification, in the case of race, is not genetically determined and no genetic ancestry test can prescribe a person's race. As I see it, the real utility of using genetic ancestry tests in this manner is that it can be informative about how biology and culture work together to shape human experience. In my work, I study the biogeographic origins of African descendants in the Caribbean. Using principles of community-engaged research, I use genetic data to fill gaps in knowledge that were created by centuries of political, economic, and social marginalization levied against African and indigenous Caribbean peoples. In particular, genetic data have been useful in illuminating the African origins of different Caribbean communities, as well as providing some insights about the relationships between African descendants and indigenous American uh, peoples in the islands. So in my most recent project, along with my collaborators, a cultural anthropologist and a sociologist community activist, we're studying both the genetic and community histories of Afro-Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. Our ultimate goal of this study is threefold. Uh, we hope to learn more about the genetic origins of Afro-Puerto Ricans. Secondly, we want to examine how Afro-Puerto Ricans understand biological and cultural dimensions of their past. And third, we hope to facilitate local artistic interpretations of genetic ancestry and community history. Though the work has started and stopped first due to Hurricane Maria in 2017, and now the pandemic, we have had a chance to start this project and we do have some preliminary results. So far, we've learned that study participants all have some degree of African, of indigenous Caribbean, and European ancestry, though these ancestry values are highly variable between participants. Secondly, we've also learned that com the community shares ancestries with peoples among a large region of Western Africa. Specifically, we see shared ancestry among peoples of Upper and Lower, Gu Lower Guinea, and to a lesser extent in West Central Africa. We also see that relative to at least one other island, Barbados, Afro-Puerto Ricans' African ancestry is more variable, suggesting that there were potentially different iterations of African influx into the Caribbean, and this is reflected in patterns of genetic variation. Consequently, there may be some unrecognized heterogeneity of African descendants throughout the Americas. Another way of putting this is that African ancestry is not the same 
across populations within the diaspora. And what this means or how this translates to understandings of how culture shapes experience, including health outcomes, well, that remains to be seen. In the near future, we will continue to work on this project focusing on the nature of genetic ancestry in Louisa, Piñones, and other self-recognized Black communities in Puerto Rico. We also want to learn more about what genetic data may reveal about African and Indigenous American interactions in Puerto Rico and more broadly in the Caribbean. Ultimately, we hope to understand more about how participants talk about their ancestors and how they make sense of their genetic ancestry results. We also hope to offer a different perspective one that is purposefully inclusive of those who have been overlooked on the history and peoples of Puerto Rico, as well as the Caribbean. Through my research, I reimagine and reclaim knowledge about the experiences of African and indigenous peoples throughout the Caribbean. This from my studies among Afro-Puerto Ricans highlights the complexities of how people think about the past and present as well as the intertwining nature of biology and culture. Moreover, my work illustrates that though genetic ancestry and scientific approaches to identity in general can be problematic for marginalized communities, there remains a possibility of harnessing these same technologies in ways that serve to pres preserve and reconcile the histories of these same communities. So as I wrap up today, I want to first thank my study participants. It's through their trust with, uh, that I'm able to do any of this work and I am forever grateful for, for their participation. I also want to thank my community partner, Mari Cruz Rivera Clemente. She's our boots on the ground and, and really has made every aspect of this project go forward. Of course, I acknowledge my collaborators, Dr. Gabriel Torres Colon and Dr. Maria Nieves Colon for their help. Uh, in the study, and then of course, um, my wonderful and stellar uh, staff in my lab, including my graduate students and lab manager. And finally, I thank those who've provided funding so this work can happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jade. We hope you will join us for a live discussion with all presenters in this session at the virtual AAAS annual meeting on February 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern time.